Hello everyone, welcome to AS Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in today's video, I will be concluding chapter four of the AS Biology syllabus. So if you've just stumbled on my channel, please make sure you check out the other videos. You will see that I am posting the content of the AS Biology syllabus in a chronological order so that it is easy for you to follow and to synthesize your understanding. This channel is simply for revision. It's not necessarily a tutoring channel, but I do hope that it is helpful to those students who find things a little bit hazy in the classroom and just want to recall whatever it is that they have learned or want to cement their understanding. You can post questions to me in the comment section. I will try my best to answer them as soon as possible. So let's get into it. Movement of substances, diffusion, osmosis and other exciting ways molecules move. Now, in the first video for chapter 4, which is chapter 4.1 on this channel, you will notice that we discussed cell membrane transport and basically just mentioned how cell signaling happens and how cells communicate with each other. We also looked at the different components of a cell membrane um, in a little bit of detail. And so what we're going to do in this channel is to understand the different ways molecules move within and outside cells. And some of the ways we'll be looking at, or rather all the ways we'll be looking at, um, are diffusion, facilitated diffusion, osmosis, active transport, and bulk transport. So let's start with diffusion. What is diffusion? Diffusion is the movement of molecules from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. If you want to demonstrate diffusion at home, I usually say get a clear glass with some water in it. Now get some food coloring and pour just a little bit of that food coloring into the glass. What you will notice at first is that there will seem to be a concentration of the coloring in the section of the glass, perhaps at the top where you have just added it. But if you leave the glass for a short while without shaking it, without boiling it or doing anything to it, you will soon find that the color will spread throughout the water and the water will have a different color. This is how diffusion works. Diffusion simply means that molecules will migrate from a region where they are highly concentrated to a region where there is a low concentration of the same molecules. Diffusion usually involves the movement of solutes. So when I say solutes, I mean things that you dissolve in a solvent and a solvent is water, for example. So if we were to use sugar and water, as our example, sugar would be the solute and water would be the solvent. That means that if we add sugar to a clear glass of water, at first if we taste the water from the top, we will find that it's not as sweet as we expect because the sugar molecules based on their size tend to migrate straight to the bottom and the bottom would be a lot sweeter. Now if you leave that glass of water with the sugar in it and you don't stir it or boil it or do anything to it at all, after a while you will find that the sugar molecules have disappeared within the glass and again when you taste the water you will find that it is sweeter than it was when you first added sugar. So diffusion is the movement of solutes or movement of molecules from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. Like every chemical process, diffusion is affected by certain factors and these include the concentration gradient, the temperature, the surface area as well as the nature of the molecules. When we say concentration gradient that simply means we are referring to the difference in concentration from one region to the next. So if, for example, you have some food coloring already in your glass of water, that would affect the concentration gradient because then it basically suggests that there's already more of the solute um, in the water. You can also be affected by temperature. So if, for example, you want to get your salt or your sugar to dissolve faster in water, you just simply need to apply a little bit of heat and you will find that the molecules migrate a lot faster. The surface area is also very important because the greater the surface area, the better the rate of diffusion. The nature of the molecules that are diffusing is also important. So I usually use an example of a person cooking a meal and a person pouring a glass of water on the floor. So if you are cooking a meal, a very delicious spicy meal that is very flavorant, um, or should I say aromatic, you are likely to smell the meal faster than you're likely to have water move from one end of a room to the other. This is because the aroma of food is con is conveyed in gas molecules. So gas molecules move faster than liquid molecules. And as a result of that, the nature of molecules definitely affects the rate of diffusion. 
Another kind of diffusion is what we call facilitated diffusion. Now, if you remember correctly, when we looked at the cell membrane structure in the previous video, and again, if you haven't watched this video, please make sure you do so. We said that within the cell membrane, we have what we call the channel proteins and the carrier proteins. These proteins are very important simply because they allow the diffusion of molecules across the cell membrane, especially for molecules that cannot cross the cell membrane on their own. So bearing that in mind, facilitated diffusion is a type of diffusion whereby carrier and channel proteins help with the transport of large polar molecules of and ions from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. In other words, facilitated diffusion is the same as diffusion. The difference is that the molecules need a carrier protein or a channel protein in order to move across the cell membrane. And this helps them because the cell cell membrane is made up of hydrophobic tails, which means only hydrophobic molecules like hormones such as steroid hormones are able to cross through and ions are not able to pass through. So ions like sodium ions or chloride ions might not be able to pass through. These ions will then need to move through a carrier protein or a channel protein in order to get either into the cell or out of the cell. And just so you know, some of the characteristics of channel proteins is that they are water-filled pores, and so they allow ions such as sodium and potassium ions to pass through the cell. Channel proteins are also gated proteins. When we say we're discussing gated proteins, we mean proteins that only open in response to certain signals. This is very important when you get into A-level biology and you're discussing coordination. Channel proteins also have fixed shapes, Always think of channel proteins as a tunnel or think of them as like a pipe that is underground in a swamp, if we can think of it that way. And they allow molecules to get through the swamp without necessarily walking through the swamp. So that is how I try to picture it when I am explaining it. This is just an image to show you the difference between a channel protein and a carrier protein. So a channel protein, like the name suggests, is just a channel. It's a space that allows molecules to go from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration without changing its shape. It has a fixed shape. So think of it as like a, a drainage or a gully system that just allows water to flow through, for example. Carrier proteins, on the other hand, tend to bind to molecules, absorb them, and then release them at another end. So carrier proteins and channel proteins differ in the fact that a carrier protein changes its shape as it binds to a molecule in order to release the molecule at the other end of the membrane, whereas a channel protein is open to molecules and simply allows them to flow through. If the channel protein is a gated protein, then the channel will only open whenever there is a signal that requires it to do so. This brings us to the next kind of transport, which is osmosis. So just to recall, we have discussed diffusion, which is the movement of molecules from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. And then we have discussed facilitated diffusion, whereby molecules are moving from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, but use the carrier and the channel proteins in the cell membrane. When it comes to osmosis, on the other hand, osmosis is not necessarily the movement of solute molecules. Osmosis is the movement of water, and it moves water from a dilute solution to a more concentrated solution through a partially permeable membrane. And th what this means is that osmosis is basically the movement of water from a region of high water potential, which means high concentration of water or a more dilute solution, to a region of low water potential, which is a region of low concentration of water. And that means there's a high solute concentration in that water. When we speak of water potential, we are referring to how much water the solution contains in relation to solids. So if I put a teaspoon of sugar in a glass of water and I put three teaspoons of sugar in another glass of water that contains the same volume as the first glass, the first glass will be a more dilute solution and as a result will have a higher water potential compared to the second glass which has three teaspoons of sugar and would have a lesser water water concentration. 
this is an image that shows uh, very clearly what osmosis looks like. So if you look at this image, on the right side, we have sucrose molecules. So think of sucrose as sugar. And then on the left side, we have water. And we have what we call a partially permeable membrane. Remember that the cell membrane of our cells is also partially permeable. So always think of it as this membrane that regulates the flow of substances um, to allow balance within the body. So if you look here, you will see that the water molecules molecules will tend to move. If you look at the big purple arrow or the pink arrow rather, you will see that water molecules tend to move from a region where they are highly concentrated to a region where they have lower concentration due to the presence of a solute and they move across a partially permeable membrane. So always just remember that when you're defining osmosis, that osmosis is the movement of water from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration through a semi-permeable membrane or a differentially permeable membrane. Now, when we speak of osmosis, uh, we usually also try to consider what happens in plant cells whenever they undergo osmosis. So in animal cells, for example, animal cells are more concentrated. If we take an animal cell or a red blood cell with all of its components and we put it in a glass of pure water, what's going to happen to that red blood cell because water moves from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration is that the red blood cell will take up a lot of water and that Will cause it to bust. We usually call that hemolysis. Hemolysis spelled as H E M O L Y S I S. Hemolysis simply means that the red blood cell would burst because it has taken up too much water. Plant cells, on the other hand, tend not to burst because they have a cell wall outside of their cell membrane. So this cell wall ensures that they are able to keep their shape even if the cell membrane expands. So if you look at the first um, image here, that's the very first one where it says cell in a dilute solution become turgid. What that simply means is that if you take a plant cell and you put it in a cup of pure water, the water will move into the cell and that causes the cell to become more turgid so it means that there's increased pressure in the cell simply because you filled it with more water if you put the plant cell in a solution that contains the same amount of solutes as it does then the plant cell will simply stay the same if you take a plant cell however and you put it in a solution that has a high concentration of solutes so let's say we take a plant cell and we put it in a solution that has a lot of sugar what will happen is that water will move out of the plant cell into the sugar solution because again water moves from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration and as a result of that the cell will become flaccid flaccid simply means that the cell has now lost water and so it is not as turgid as it would be and it is not necessarily keeping its shape in a firm form we also have plasmolysis and plasmolysis is simply when the cell remains in a concentrated solution for so long that it starts to lose an alarming amount of water. What that means then is that the cytoplasm will pull away from the cell wall because it is losing its water content to the environment. So that is what happens when you put a plant cell in different solutions of water and this is a very popular question in CAIE. So please make sure you pay attention to it or you just look it up and try to cement your understanding where this is concerned. The other type of transport that we have is called active transport. Active transport is a type of transport that uses energy. So even just thinking of the word active in the name, it uses energy because it takes molecules from a region of low concentration to a region of high concentration. So if you want to think of active transport, think of it as the opposite of diffusion. Diffusion takes molecules from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. Active transport does the exact opposite of that. It takes molecules from a region of low concentration to a region of high concentration. And in this case, we say that the molecules are moving against the concentration gradient. And what active transport does is that it uses ATP, which means it uses energy to ensure this transport. Diffusion, facilitated diffusion, osmosis, those do not use ATP at all because we call them different types of passive 
transport. They are passive in the sense that the molecules are simply going around the natural order of things. So they are moving from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. That is the natural order. But in active transport, it goes against the concentration gradient and requires energy in order for it to occur. This shows you very clearly the difference between active transport and passive transport. So you can see with active transport, which is the first image on the left, that the molecules are moving from a region of low concentration to a region of high concentration and so as a result are using ATP. Passive transport, on the other hand, includes diffusion and facilitated diffusion. The molecules move from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. The last type of transport is bulk transport. There are two types of bulk transport that you have to know. There is endocytosis and there is exocytosis. Endocytosis simply means engulfing. And you can see from this image over here that there are two types of endocytosis. You have phagocytosis and you have pinocytosis. Phagocytosis is basically when the cell engulfs a solid particle. So we call it cell eating. And what that where that becomes important is when we discuss immunity, how the body fights infections. So if you have an infection within your body, what will typically happen is that you have cells called phagocytes and these phagocytes will move to the source of the infection, considering that it's another cell itself and they engulf it and digest it so that it is unable to wreak havoc within your body. Pinocytosis is also the same. It's the intake of liquid material. So phagocytosis is the intake of solid, while pinocytosis is the intake of liquid. And again, just like I said, the two types of endocytosis are phagocytosis and pinocytosis. So please make sure you familiarize yourself with these because they are very important. The other type of bulk transport is exocytosis. And just like the name suggests, it is the exit. So it is the opposite of endocytosis. It is the exit of material from within the cell. This is important when the cell is secreting proteins or digestive enzymes. And what you will find is that you have the Golgi body, which would secrete the enzyme in vesicles, and the vesicles move to the cell membrane and release the particles that they are carrying out of the cell. So we call that exocytosis. Something else I have noticed with CIE biology is that you tend to find questions where this image is given to you and you are asked to label the different parts. So always take note of what the Golgi body looks like. Remember that the circle that's carrying the particles or the molecules is called a vesicle and whatever it is that it releases can be the material, proteins, enzymes, depending on what the question says. I will try as much as possible to find a question that has this and explain it to you so that you are able to see an example. So this brings me to the end of chapter four of the A-level biology syllabus. I hope you have found this very helpful. Please make sure you watch the other videos to help you revise for your biology A exams and I will see you when we start chapter 5 but before chapter 5 I will be doing some past question papers again just to show you what the questions look like for chapters 3 and chapter 4. Until then have a good time.